come ma ye gallant for the self water moss and fell they are your will can't nooks and crooks forever fare thee well will gan they made a roven a roven and a neck will gan they made a roven let them and shine as they break will gan they made a roven For centuries, the borderlands of England and Scotland were dominated by powerful families. In this series, I'm travelling around the borderlands and I'm looking at these border reaver families in greater detail. Where were they based? How powerful were they? What did they do that made them a force to be reckoned with? In this first episode, I'm going to look at the history of the Kerr family, a powerful and pragmatic group of people, a family with many enemies. The name Kerr is found in various forms with different spell and variations, and there's also different ways to pronounce the name as well, such as Kerr or Kerr. And the name stems from the Old Norse Kjar, which means Marsh Dweller. It came to the borders from Normandy, and tradition in the family states that the Norman origin of the family came from two brothers, Ralph and Robert. Robert also was sometimes known by John. They came to Ruxborough by way of Lancashire, and as I'll be getting into during this video, there were two main branches of the Kerr family. The Kerrs of Sesford and the Kerrs of Fernihurst. The Sesford Kerrs claim descent from Robert, and the Kerrs of Fernihurst claim descent from Ralph. I'll be visiting these two places and discussing their history and how it fits in with the Kerr family story. The Kerrs quickly built themselves into a powerful and feared family. And while it may be true that the Reavers as a whole had more loyalty to their families than they did to their country's monarchs and the church, they weren't all constant enemies of the crown. Sometimes they were given political and legal power and jurisdiction. And this is true of the Kerrs, who consistently showed a great deal of loyalty to the Scottish crown. With great loyalty, came great reward, and so the Kerrs were granted lands, titles and office. In 1513, the Battle of Flodden had been a disastrous defeat for Scotland. They lost a huge amount of men and a great number of the Scottish nobility. King James IV himself also died in this battle. The Kerrs had fought alongside him, as Reven families often did, alongside the King of the Scots, but they were defeated by the English Earl of Surrey. Just after the battle, Andrew Kerr of Sesford was made Warden of the Middle March, a powerful title that gave his family much prestige in the central Scottish border region. Ten years later came the Siege of Sesford Castle by the Earl of Surrey, a key stronghold in the Middle March. 1523. The Earl had eleven cannons, and the Kerr family were feeling the full force of English might against their family stronghold. The castle held out successfully against the English artillery, but eventually the Kerrs negotiated a surrender and agreed their safe passage away from the castle. The Earl considered this to be one of the strongest castles in Scotland, and he remarked it might never have been taken had the assailed been able to go on defending. At some point the Kerrs returned to their home, but in 1545, It was taken by the English again in Henry VIII's rough wooing. Welcome then to Sesford Castle. Except it's not actually a castle, it's a tower house, but you can understand why people call it a castle. It's absolutely massive. The family that lived here were very powerful and they they wanted to convey that message. This was built around the year 1450 by a man named Andrew Kerr and it would become one of the main strongholds for the Kerr family. In a moment, I'm going to show you around the inside of Sesford, but first of all, you can't make a video about the Kerr family without talking about left-handedness. The Kerrs were famous for being left-handed, or at least fighting with the left hand. A number of key Kerr family members or headmen were left-handed, and they encouraged others in the family to fight with their left hand too, also known as Kerr-handed. 
a left-handed mercenary warrior could command a much higher fee for his services. Always the pragmatists the Kurs were. As an additional point of interest, an article in the British Medical Journal from around 1972 stated that about 30% of those with the surname Kerr were left-handed, compared to 11% of the world's population. So the walls of this tower house are four meters thick. It is formidable. And to be honest, the Kurds needed it. They had a lot of enemies. It wasn't just the English that tried to take this place. They had a bit of feud with the Scots, um, not the Scots as in the nationality, but the Scots, the family, uh, the ancestors of Sir Walter Scott, um, as well as other Kurds as well. The Kurds of Sesford were for a long time at a feud with the Kurds of Fernihurst. So Sesford Tower had room for a garrison of about 60 men plus a few extra family members and servants. So there's a lot of people packed into here. And you can imagine when the Earl of Surrey was attacking this place, just what it must have been like inside these walls. Looking out and seeing a whole army trying to take your family home. You know, it just goes to show that you do need to keep your, uh, keep your family close, especially in troubled times. And what I love about this place as well is that you can still see up there the fireplace. The fireplace is still recognizably intact there. Remember in tower houses, the living quarters would have been up on the first floor, not the ground floor. So you can just imagine over the many years that the Kurs lived here, the conversations they had around the fire what they talked about, what, uh, what raids they planned, what uh, counter raids they planned, um, the conversations they had about, about all sorts really, it's incredible. We're now gonna go to Fernihurst Castle, very close to the English border, home of the Fernihurst Kerrs. It's actually still in the hands of the Kerr family today, and it's not open to the public, but I was given very kind permission to film the castle exterior. Built as a tower house in 1470, Fernihurst will become one of the seats of power of the Kerrs. In 1523, the year Sesford was taken, Fernihurst likewise came under attack by the English Lord Dacre, Acton under the orders of the Earl of Surrey. Fernihurst fell, and it remained in English hands until 1549, when the Kurs took it back with French assistance. The English garrison was hacked apart and their commander was beheaded. I'm going to read a piece of a poem that was written in 1900 by Walter Laidlaw called The Reprisal, which commemorates the recapture of the castle by the Kurs. The castle, raised from tower to floor, was built and garrisoned once more. The Scots and French, led on by Kerr, courageous and well trained to war. On horse and foot, from far and near, with jetted axe and border spear, responded to the bugle call, they storm and scale the outer wall. Though strong the tower, a breach they made, through which the English captain said, my noble chief, we mercy crave. You'll get the mercy that you gave. Fifteen 
Few families conducted as much reaving and fighting as the Kurs did, and this made them a great deal of enemies. Not only did the family feud with each other, but they fought with the Selbys, the Herons, the Collingwoods, the Turnbulls, the Rutherfords, the Scots, and even the town of Jedburgh. Brothers and sisters are natural enemies, like Englishmen and Kurs. Or Kurs. And Scots. Or Turnbulls and Kurs. Or Kurs and other Kurs. Jam. Kurs. They ruined the borders. You Kurs. Sure are a contentious people. You just made an enemy for life. Each feud would really require its own video, but I'll give a brief overview of the three most well-remembered conflicts the family was engaged in. Firstly, the famous feud between the Kerrs and the Scots. A fascinating story. These families spent decades at war with one another, and it all began at the Battle of Melrose in 1526, when Archibald Douglas, the Earl of Angus, refused to give up his expired guardianship of the young King James V. James called upon the Scott family to rescue him, while Douglas relied on the strength of the Kerrs to protect him. The Kerrs fought off the Scots, as well as their Elliot allies, and had them on the run. While in pursuit, one of the Elliot men in the service of the Scots turned and killed the head of the Cessford Kerrs with a spear. Over the years, there were attempts at peace but conflict would inevitably break out again and again. The Kerrs often went above and beyond to teach the Scots who was the more powerful family. They joined up with Englishmen to raid Scott territory, and even burned down Cat's Lake Tower in 1548, the home of the Dowager Lady Buccleuch, Elizabeth Scott, who died in the flames. Interestingly, Elizabeth was a Kerr by blood, and she just married into the Scott family. The Kerrs also killed the elderly Walter Scott of Buccleuch in 1552 while he was walking down an Edinburgh street, 26 years after the Kerr headman had been slain. Say what you want about Border Reavers, but they don't have short memories. Family honour had to be restored. The Scots then made a move to end this feud once and for all. Walter Scott's widow secured with the crown that the Kerr family be completely outlawed. And while the severity of this was relaxed quite a bit, it was a good few years before the Kerrs were comfortable in the position that they had once enjoyed before the feud began. The feud with Jedburgh is likewise an interesting conflict, and it links in with one of the reasons the two main branches of the Kerr family fought each other. Aside from differences in goals and interests, the Kerrs of Fernihurst supported Mary Queen of Scots, while the Kerrs of Cessford supported the young King James VI. Sir Thomas Kerr of Fernihurst was a big supporter of Mary and fought for her with his men at the Battle of Langside in 1568, while the Cessford Kerrs fought against her. Now the town of Jedburgh, just on the doorstep of Fernihurst Castle, supported King James VI, and Thomas Kerr wasn't too happy with this. He started a feud with the town in 1572 and made a number of raids there, and he was joined by two unlikely allies, old enemies of the Kerr family. First of all, a number of Englishmen joined him, mostly outlaws and brigands, led by a man named Alexander Trotter. And most surprisingly, the Scots of Buccleuch joined him as well, as they were also supporters of Mary. The Kerrs of Cessford would join the people of Jedburgh alongside government troops in resisting the Fernihurst incursions. The Kerrs were above all pragmatists and would always find a way to come out on top. They supported the Crown and the government when it suited them, but wouldn't hesitate to change their actions once they realised which way the wind was blowing. In 1545, during Henry VIII's invasion of Scotland, the Kerrs found themselves in the service of the numerically superior English army at the Battle of Ancrum Moor. 2,200 Border Reavers were serving in the English army, many of which were Kerrs. When the English army, which was mostly foreign mercenaries in this case, was driven back by Scottish pikemen and it became clear that they were going to lose, 
The Kurs tore off their St. George's Cross patches and turned their cavalry into the English mercenary army, winning the day for Scotland. It was here that the Kurs gained their family motto, late but in earnest. Many figures and events I've mentioned here deserve their own videos, and one day I'll surely do that. Now, I've barely scratched the surface on Kerr history and the adventurous lives of many of the Kerr Reavers. I'm going to end this video by telling you what became of the Kerr family in the final days of the Border Reavers, but before I do, I want to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon. It's thanks to these people that I can afford to travel to all these locations you see in my videos, and if you enjoy my content, you may like to sign up as a supporter of this project to help me make future content. After the Union of the Crowns in 1603, the borders would be pacified. There was no room for lawlessness or powers other than the Crown in this new world. The Reven families would be hunted, dispossessed, deported, scattered and killed. The Kerrs, being the influential family they were, took the side of the Crown and would morph into a more traditional style of nobility. For their loyalty to Scotland and the Crown, Honours were heaped upon the Kerrs in the years to come, with the titles bestowed on them including the Barony of Newbattle, the Earldom of Lothian, the Lordship of Jedburgh, the Earldom of Ancrum, and the Dukedom of Ruxburgh. Kerrs continued to be a people that proved themselves in battle, but never again would it be as an independent family. They were solidly on the side of the government and the crown from this point on, Yet, the Kerr pragmatism never disappeared. They played politics very well and were always to be found on the winning side. The Kerrs were loyal subjects to the Hanoverian government and played their part in fighting the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745. It was Lord Mark Kerr, the very experienced professional soldier, that was made Governor of Edinburgh Castle when government troops retook the city. Further, there were Kerrs present at the Battle of Culloden in 1746, which saw them help in putting an end to the Stuart claims on the British throne, a royal line that they had once served so well. Lord Robert Kerr was the only high-ranking government soldier to be killed at Culloden. He was captain of Grenadiers in Barrel's regiment, as you can see on this image of battle formations at Culloden. Opposite his regiment was Clan Cameron, and when Bonnie Prince Charlie's Highland army charged the government line, Robert Kerr killed the leading Cameron man with his spontoon, only to be immediately cut down by another Highlander. Also notice Robert's older brother, William Kerr, commanding Kerr's regiment of dragoons. He commanded all of the cavalry on the left wing of the government force. He'd later go on to serve with the Duke of Cumberland on the continent shortly after the battle. The Kerrs remain a big landowning family in the borders to this day. It's a fairly common name in both England and Scotland, and there are of course many descendants of the Kerrs across the world, mostly in America and Australia. Many people take pride in their Kerr heritage by wearing Kerr tartan and kilts and such, although the Kerrs historically never wore tartan or kilts. They were a border family, not a highland family. It's somewhat ironic given the Kerrs played their part in bringing about the dissolution of highland culture by their involvement in the Jacobite Rebellion, as well as other instances such as the sacking and demolition of Clan Mackenzie's Red Castle on the Black Isle by a Kerr in the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. Regardless, a proud, pragmatic and battle-scarred family, if ever there was one. <laughs>